Hello and welcome back to the conversation here at Breaking the Consensus at Protect Life. Uh, today I'm delighted uh, to be able to be talking to David Mullins, David Zinarco, and he is going to talk about the ethical implications that we need to consider at this time of the pandemic. He, he's a, his training is in bioethics, but I think the best thing to do is let him explain a little bit about that himself. So David, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you. So, a little bit about yourself. You're an Arclo, but you're not an Arclo man, thank God. I said a gory man. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm originally from uh, Clonmel in Tipperary, and as I always say, I emigrated to, uh, to Arclo, <laughs> another country, but it was, um, no, I came here around uh, 13 or 14 years ago, and I got married here, and I, uh, I, I had kids. Uh, I'll tell you what, you know, you, you know how, you know how men hurl now? <laughs> Not our soft Tipperary hurling in, in South Wicklow, it's proper hurling. Hurling like Cucullin would, rec would recognise. <laughs> I don't do that for a minute. <laughs> the South Wicklow League was famous for many reasons, for many many a referee in the boot of a Renault again. So, you're, you're based, now you have uh, a back, your, your background in, academically is in, in bioethics. How, That's right. How does that start? How do you get to that? Okay. Well, I, I initially started off with um, doing a, a theology degree in St. Patrick's Pontifical mm -hmm. in Maynooth. And from there, I just I went on um, and did postgraduate work there um, as well under uh, Father Pora Corkery, or Professor Pora Corkery now. And um, what I focused on at that time was um, ethical alternatives to embryonic stem cell research. And that right. was based on, it was basically an analysis of a document, a President's Council of Bioethics document in the US that came out in 2005-ish around that time. And um, it was that, that document presented a couple of alternatives. And basically what I did was just an ethical and kind of theological analysis of those proposals. And, and basically the, the interest kind of has grown from there and I've stayed with it and I've, I've written, about, written about bioethics since then. I've tutor to postgraduate students and that's what I've done. I've kind of I continued to write about it, maintain an interest and wrote for various uh, publications, the Irish Catholic and Iona and a few others, you know, as well, the Furrow and Intercom and uh, mostly it would have been in the kind of Christian response, Catholic Christian response to um, ethical, ethical issues as they arise in terms of biotechnology, emerging technologies, early interventions upon early life, um, all of that, all okay. of those areas really like, you know, so. So uh, just Bioethics is essentially it's a philosophical, yeah. Usually, yep. a sort of a philosophical rather than a theological yeah. pursuit, and yeah. it's a kind of a, if you like, it's a subset of of moral philosophy. Yeah. So, well, what, what's the difference between say moral philosophy and ethics? Okay. What, what are bioethics? What is ethics? Yeah. Right. Well, I suppose for a long time the two terms were kind of synonymous in terms of moral philosophy would have been understood, especially well within the Christian tradition, and broadly speaking within the academic tradition for a good part of West, for European history really um, it would moral philosophy would have encompassed everything from you know uh, ethical issues in relation to healthcare sexual ethics all of that all of that would have been I, you know under the umbrella of moral philosophy like mm. but I think um, uh, in, in it was really um, in the, the latter well the early half of the 20th century really that kind of bioethics or ethics as we understand it today anyway definitely took off. Uh, became it became a, its own subset like you know in terms mm -hmm. of the term itself i think was coined in the 60s by i think 70 by van ranz or Patton and uh, his own book on that but it was on and it's kind of uh, i think I, the, the reason why ethics bioethics has become so much of a kind of a, a prominent subset is because basically because technological the technological right. advances and that's what made that's what gave a certain urgency to kind of the ethical reflection that it needed a kind of focused area within itself and and bioethics is heavily interdisciplinary like it's not um it's not necessarily attached to a theological you can have theological bioethics of course mm -hmm. um uh, you can have that but you don't have to it does all kinds of bioethics you know in terms of you know kantian consequentialist utilitarian i mean you name it i mean basically any kind of you know Nietzschean, it doesn't matter right. in terms of, you know there's uh there's all that there's that there but um but no, ethics generally, I suppose, speaking is just, you know, we know that it's just the kind of systematic approach, the kind of scientific systematic approach to right. concepts of right and wrong, whereas morality may tend to be a bit more specific to one group. So you're working within, shall we say, a, roughly a, a, a Catholic ethical tradition. Yes. So I suppose people like Thomas Aquinas would be yeah. important. Elizabeth Anscombe. 
Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. The hands come, yeah, the hands come philosophies. And, uh, and yeah, the Thomistic analysis in terms of, uh, yeah, the kind of the philosophical approach, that would have been, I mean, I did some, I, I incorporated some Thomism in terms of, uh, Thomas was great in terms of, uh, you know, identifying, say, the, the, the uh, in terms of uh, what is a person. What are the philosophical what, what are the philosophical kind of uh, principles around how we establish personhood and all of that you know so um you know the Thomistic analysis would have been great there but um and in the life issue the that, that's life one of the central issue. questions of course isn't it absolutely yeah yeah. Yeah. yeah for sure yeah and i mean he would have approached it from a very specific point of view i suppose in terms of the the soul the infused soul as we call it now like i mean that basically where the, the life principle where did that when did that start at what point did mm -hmm. that start and although we use very different language about that these uh, you know these days in contemporary debate there's very different kind of language used about that but that issue is still pretty much um it's still pretty pretty central to a lot of the debates that go on especially around the embryonic debate you know when does it actually become when, when you know are we talk, when does it when, is a human is human life always does it always mean a human person you know can you talk about a human life without talking about being a human person and that debate is still you know still very controversial but it's still going around yeah so i thought today we just would touch on you know, we, what else can we talk about except naturally yes yeah uh, the pandemic this is where we are and it's yeah. it's throwing up a lot of different mm. issues mm. and i suppose when the, the the reason why in a way we do ethics we, we do philosophy is to mm. have a preparation so that we don't have to work out the answer Yes. right now and it's and although at the times it feels like that's what we're doing yeah people are being presented with a question and it's like they're working in a vacuum yes yeah they're, they're trying to come up with a question that there hasn't been any kind of pre-discussion about these things and so mm. we, we, people mm. are coming to conclusions and maybe these are conclusions they may regret in the future so there are mm. lots of issues here because we're talking about treatment we're talking about life and death issues mm. we're talking about the distribution of scarce resources mm. uh, all of these mm. they're, they're they're difficult mm. and i suppose it's fair to say that it would be wrong to expect that we're going to get simple clear cut answers mm. yes. a lot of the time yeah yeah i, I agree i agree I, I think that there's a there is um you can have a you can have a clar clarity of vision but that doesn't kind of detract from the complexity of in terms of how the how the clarity or the vision is applied within each within individual circumstances and that's what happens and i think you're right that you know we do have a kind of um uh, the pandemic has kind of forced us to confront you know especially what are our ethical priorities you know and uh i, I remember some years ago um there was an english philosopher mary midgley and she wrote a book you know uh on, on, on basically on philosophical different aspects of philosophical debates but she used a good kind of handy analogy she said it was like a bit like uh philosophy and ethics in times like this is a bit like she called it philosophical plumbing you know you never really notice it until it goes wrong you know in a sense you know and it's only when you actually need it when you need something to work and it's not there that's when you really notice the absence of it in a sense and she kind of made this uh just, it was kind of pretty pretty neat but she um but I, I do agree, like in terms of, and in some ways we're kind of we're kind of quite lucky here, um, in the sense that, especially when the, from the Judeo-Christian, the Western tradition, like we've had a long experience of dealing with this, like, and that's by virtue of a lot of things, especially the the sheer just the sheer longevity of the church as an institution that for many centuries it's engaged in philosophical and theological consideration of these issues, and they, again they may not have been framed in exactly in these terms, but some of them would. There's something the church was around in the original, you know, the Black Plague, all of that, and the, the bubonic plague, and everything else. And it was um, uh, so a lot of they would have had, as, and obviously the the Spanish flu, you know. So the church would have been engaged in a lot of ethical discourse around that time, and that, that's all contributed to where we are today. It's certainly. You know, so you mentioned the Spanish flu. I mean, mm. was that was there was there a lot of ethical de de debate about around that? Right. I think I, I think there was, in the sense like that it wasn't. I mean, in terms of uh, ethical debate in, in the context of what we know today, in terms of you know kind of this um, the prominent the prominence of it. But I definitely think that there was a certain understanding within um, within medical care about how do we prioritize care. All of those debates have been going on for a long, long time. I think that they didn't just emerge out of nowhere, like in a sense, and um, especially- we're talking, yeah. Sorry, we're talking about, you're, you're touching on the medical, so I suppose one of the most pressing issues that we were facing is this issue of triage, yes, you call it yeah. that. So yeah. could you just talk about triage as a general idea and how you approach 
ethically, to explain what triage is and how you okay. approach it as, as an ethic. Yeah, okay, order. so triage basically is in a situation where you're kind of confronted with limited resources or limited capacity to intervene in a heavily kind of uh, heavily pressurized environment. Like, you know, so for example, I mean, and most triage situations are not related to say pandemics or epidemics. Most triage situations within hospitals are based around, um, you know, uh, major public incidents, like in terms of a terrorist event or a major, you know, transport accident where a, where a hospital or a hospital or a care facility is, is immediately overwhelmed and it's just it's not prepared. So you have to say, you have to start making radical choices around, okay, we have limited capacity for intervention. How do we assess and score and prioritize the, those interventions? And what are the criteria that we use to do that? And in terms of the pandemic today, a lot of that is around trying to you know there are, there are established principles and our own i mean the, the department of health has issued its own pan, ethical pan guidance for pandemics and that's that you know uh, that there's a lot of great stuff in that uh, it doesn't get into too many particulars in terms of the, the clinical side of things it leaves that but just set, you know it provides a kind of good ethical framework but within a triage situation i suppose what they're talking about is again again it's a the, the difficulty is how do we prioritize intervention and one of the ways which is kind of quite interesting uh you know that has been devised to avoid a clash between the ethical and ethical and the clinical in a triage situation is to apply something like what they call this this uh, sequestration of organ failure so the sofa analysis okay so they kind of they have these clinical markers you get a clinical uh, an analysis is taken maybe from the liver or the kidneys of each of the patients and you by that you establish an order or a ranking about you know who who uh, say mortality markers it's a kind of very it's a bit insensitive kind of but that's the way it's understood that's the terminology that's used like you know so you're able to define at a clinical level who is at greatest risk and that's a quite that's in very in many ways that's a very that's a very appropriate and that's a very um fair way of assessing needs so you're not what it does the benefit of it largely from an ethical point of view is that you're not adopting a kind of default position where you're automatically excluding one patient over another and that you're saying i'm applying a fair the fairest ethic the fairest clinical criteria to avoid a, to, or to bring about an ethical outcome as well as a good ethical outcome you know so just on declarative this is based they look at the the, the 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 medical condition, the clinical condition of, of patients, and yeah. the decision is based on the person who is in greatest need, or has yeah. it, is greatest risk. Yeah, well, they try. That's what they try to establish through this the sofa mm. analysis of sequestration of organ failure. So they mm. say, you know, from a from a clinical point of view, from a medical point of view, who uh, if we inter who let us how can we choose who to intervene upon? Okay, so they apply the sofa analysis and they say, uh, patient does three patients come in two patients and it could be no matter what we do they're not going to they may not survive there's a there's a five percent chance of survival but the seek but the sofa analysis has revealed that uh, the clinical markers have revealed that say in patient number three there's a 60 percent chance of survival if we inter uh, if we intervene at this and that's how they you know that's, that's one way that they can choose to kind of provide or to try to to avoid any direct clash emerging between the clinical and the ethical, you know, it's a kind of it's a, it's not perfect. It's not a perfect thing. And and I think I've I've um, written a bit about this lately, where it's kind of, for example, I mean, one of the obvious difficulties that emerges is what if the three people all emerge with the same sofa score, for want of a better phrase. You know, what if right. what happens in that situation? How do you prioritize? And then there's other kind of, you know, other ethical considerations have to come to play. For example, say one of the examples I gave recently was what if one of the three patients was all, all things being equal what if one of the patients was an acclaimed virologist on the cusp of making a breakthrough for a vaccine should he be should he or she be prioritized for care in that mm -hmm. sense like you know and I think that you probably could prioritize if the if the sofa score emerged equally you could probably do that ethically and fairly but one of the dangers there is that again you kind of have to be careful that you're not avoiding a kind of uh, a utilitarian thing or a kind of a status approach to somebody that just simply because of their their status as an acclaimed virologist in quotes uh, that they're kind of deserve or are or, or, or necessarily in um yeah that condition. So, okay on this basis you're saying there there are two aspects i think to what you're saying mm. first is uh, the likelihood that an intervention will be successful yeah. is part of the equation yes but also uh, is on the other hand, do you also consider 
the the necessity for so if somebody is shall we say less severely ill mm. than the than the other person but the other person if they get treatment more quickly mm. has a decent chance of survival you treat the more serious the, the mm. person who's more seriously ill first Yes, yeah, yeah, and that's and I mean, obviously those things wouldn't necessarily. You're, this, this, these are very. They're they're considerations that are specific to triage situations more. Or less, you know, are 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 generally speaking environments of limited resources, like you know, in that sense. But it wouldn't be a a general approach like where you would be prioritizing one patient over another. But generally speaking, I mean, that's the way it is in hospital. You know, and in clinical settings like that, the patient who presents with most obvious need and who has. But also, but I think it's a greater, you know, if they can establish the greater survival possibilities, you know, if they can establish that clinically, like, you know, that, that we get, we kind of give, we give, uh, we, we see that. Okay. Kind of, but, hmm. okay, let's, we're talking about, this is classically in the situation where there's been a, a massive accident or a terrorist explosion or something, and you're talking about yeah. a hospital. We've seen it in movies. You've seen war films all the time. Yeah. Mm. Guys going on triaging and, mm. you know, Charlie, this guy, this he needs this. Get him to there, whatever. It's all high activity, mm. but that's not what we're talking about at the moment here. Mm. Um, if we look, say, in the in the case in Ireland, we're looking at the case in other cases. One of the great concerns has been mm. to make sure that the health system wasn't overwhelmed, so you yes. didn't actually reach a point where you actually mm. had triage happening in the hospitals. Yeah, but that ice that hospital beds were made, the hospital system was kept intact we had beds available we had capacity we had icu capacity mm. and one of the things that that meant that there was a kind of a pre-triage happening possibly mm -hmm. yes and so decisions were being made in some jurisdictions for example mm. decisions were made that people over the age of 80 mm. would not be sent to hospital yeah that people between the ages of 60 and 80 Mm. who had an, uh, who had who were suffering another condition would not be sent to hospital mm -hmm. and that was in a sense that was being done on the basis that this would maintain the integrity of the health system and it wouldn't be overwhelmed mm. now my first question is how, how do you is that a, that's a slightly different kind of a choice there isn't it yes yeah yeah it is and it the is, second and elite and i let you deal with the point the part two of that is we're now in a situation where whatever this means we flatten the curve mm. we have ma we have actually vast far far more capacity than mm. we thought we were going to have yes yeah we have empty hospitals in fact all over the place mm -hmm. the, the private hospitals are empty mm. pepton facilities in gory and westward are empty mm. and yet the same process seems to be going ahead with the triaging of people not being in, admitted to icu and one of the principal operant factors in this seems to be age yeah how do you react to that yeah i don't see i i, I certainly think that it's very uh, uh, difficult if not impossible certainly from the tradition i come from to justify age as a per se basis to exclude people from treatment that you should not do that i think i i i, I just don't think that that's either ethically or, or even clinically defensible in terms of uh, as a viable approach now i'm not a clinician okay but i'm just making a kind of an ethical assessment of it because one of the one of the immediate difficulties with that that jumps out for me is say is age of course age to some degree must be taken into account okay but it shouldn't be the first and last consideration because say for example you have uh, uh ethicists like uh, the swedish ethicist lars sandman okay he's been very heavily kind of involved in drawing up the swedish model now it's not you know we would have maybe some problems with it but but one of the difficulties there that he's identified for example is to say that okay if there's a if you're approaching if you're approaching age from say if there's biological age and there's chronological age okay so uh so the biological age somebody you could be literally you could be 20 or 30 you know in chronological years but your mm -hmm. biological age could be far 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 more than that you could be you could be 60 70 80 and your you, in chronological terms, but your biological age could be far lower than that. So it's 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 not as simple as just saying, okay, you are you were born in 19, uh, 1920, whatever you know, or in nineteen forty, say whatever, and therefore you were automatically excluded. I think that you cannot really adopt. It's not really ethically credible 
or it, it shouldn't be anyway, I don't think, to adopt a position mm -hmm. where you're just default excluding people on the basis of age, that they're far, that it's far more complicated than that, than, uh, you know, instead of, uh, like I said, just automatically excluding people. In that because context, it seems like age is being used in, in an excessively arbitrary way. Absolutely, yeah. Well, that's that, that's the fear. That's the concern, isn't it? I mean, in the terms of we've seen that here in terms of our own public response, that it, within the nursing homes and with other non-acute kind of residential settings, that people were kind of, um, uh, there is a kind of there's a, there's it's emerging, you know, and it's uncomfortable like that that the that older people or people of an older older age were essentially an afterthought. And that's not a political judgment. Like that's like okay, something that they did not even factor into the equation at the beginning. And my point there was, in terms of like that, raises questions about accountability. It raises all kinds of things. But uh, but uh, my own position is, of course, that some serious accountability is going to be had over that because I know some people. It is possible to say, look, in hindsight, we could have done things better, and in hindsight, we you know we should have maybe uh, made a more immediate or swifter intervention to the nursing homes. But that's okay. That's fine to a point. But I think uh, where foresight was possible, you don't, you should not have the excuse of hindsight. You know that we only had hindsight, and foresight was absolutely possible in this case, and certainly in the case in, in the cases of the nursing homes here. You know, foresight was possible. We knew from the beginning that COVID uh, disproportionately attacked the older older members of our communities and those with, our, with COVID underlying conditions are immunosuppressed. So that foresight was there from the beginning. You know, so there's a going to be a, there's going to have to be a, a reckoning. I think a moral, a moral or ethical reckoning at some stage about the approach that we've taken to to you know to residents of nursing homes. Wouldn't people be saying, "Oh well, we we couldn't have known." I, I frankly, I think that's nonsense. Yes. Every government in the developed world has a plan for a pandemic. Mm -hmm. so, some of you have. You've plans for pandemics. You've plans for uh, chemical. War, you have nuclear out, nuclear accidents, all these things. They're on fire, and they're kept. you're aware of the things you're going to need. We were told mm. a month and two months ago that, that we had no problems with supplies for PPE, all these things. Mm. But here's an, a, a, from an, as an ethical conundrum. Some people have been criticising the the care homes and other mm. facilities for not themselves being more uh, prudential in their approach. But the response I'm, I, I've been hearing is that, well, we went to our, our supplier mm. to buy this equipment, to buy this protective uh, equipment, mm. and we're told, no, we've been given instructions only to sell to the state. Mm. Mm. So essentially, the state mm. was blocking supply from precisely mm. those mm. institutions which were involved in the care of the people, which everybody knew were the most. To, uh, yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. That doesn't does how, does that strike you as ethical behaviour? No, it doesn't strike me as ethical behaviour if it can be established that that was actually the, if that established that was the case, and I think it is looking increasingly likely. Like because I think I do understand and I I do feel that there is great there is a great merit to the objection that's being raised by the nursing home sector at the moment because I mean it is just not comparing like with like in a sense like in terms of purchasing power in terms of coordinating power. In terms of all of that, that I mean, this is what's uh, one of the criticisms that's been leveled, say, within the U.S. system. You know that the states are, you know, that this, that this kind of to and fro back between the state and the federal level, that the states are saying, we look, we we'll do our bit, but ultimately the state at that level, at the federal level, has to, uh, is, that is the one with the purchasing and the coordinating power, and we when, we when we get it, and I think so. The nursing homes, I mean, how how could the nursing homes compete with the purchasing power, with the coordinating power? Or the, or the intervention power of of the state, it, they just can't. They can't do that, and it is unfair. I think it is it is unfair and it's unjust to start to you know to engage in a kind of any if it is going on, which it seems to be a kind of a, a blame game shifting of responsibility back on to, uh, for this ascent, for this really tragic kind of you know situation that's emerging within the care homes back onto the providers themselves. When it actually, I mean, you should only be accountable for the for the things that you can responsibly respond to. You know, mm -hmm. And it is unfair then to demand accountability or, or, you know, or to impose blame on the care homes, you know, for actions that they maybe they had, they could not do, or they couldn't do, they could do nothing about, or could they do very little about? Okay, I'm going to give you an example of a case that has been doing the rounds during these thought experiments. That they say there was, a, we, we'll start up. There's, there's an actual example we can we can work with, which was in Italy uh, some weeks ago. Uh, a priest 
Mm. An elderly priest was on, was on a respirator, I think. And a young person came in who was in critical condition. And the priest uh, volunteered, he, uh, more than volunteered, rather said he wanted the respirator, which there wasn't another respirator available to be given to this, this mm -hmm. young man. In the knowledge that this almost certainly meant that he would he would die. Mm -hmm. Now that's one case. That's a that's a voluntary action. The ethics mm -hmm. of that that's his case. Mm -hmm. But the other case is say you have a situation where you have an eighty year old woman, mm -hmm. eighty year old man, whatever, very seriously ill, and on a respirator. A five year old child is brought in to the ICU. There is no respirator. The chances of the older person surviving are debatable, whether or not this is going to be a good or positive outcome. Some people have been arguing that it would be ethical in this situation to remove the respiratory support, the respiration support from the woman to give it to the child. Now, if it was a case where the two came in together, both came in together and you were making the kind of assessment that you were talking about before, where you instead you're adding up a score that you could, maybe you could, you could say, well, in that case, we're going to give the respirator to the five-year-old mm -hmm. child. That, but this is, a, this is a fundamentally different question, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Or it seems to me it is anyway, and the, you tell me. No, no, I think, I mean, that is absolutely, it is a very, it is a very, a very different situation and a very, there, um, it's a very, obviously a very difficult situation. And it's, it, 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 that brings us back again to that point that, just, you know, that you may have ethical clarity and ethical guidance in certain issues does not take away from how difficult and how complex these situations are. But I think one of the things just strikes me there, um, um, just off the top of my head, is like that, uh, it would be very, I think it would be very, still very difficult to justify removing the ventilator from, uh, involuntarily removing the, the ventilator from, let's say, the 20-year-old, um, because that would mean you're essentially saying that you are going to, we're going to kill you. We're going mm -hmm. to kill you to save this person's. It's not a matter of we're going to we're going to reduce your care, but we're actually going to end your life to save this person's life. You know, that, in a but direct maybe, and intentional way. You know. Okay, maybe that's something we should talk about there. We, there's ordinary and extraordinary means. Yes. Now, it it my understanding is that it's always been the case in the Catholic tradition that you do not necessarily need to go to extraordinary lengths to maintain life. Yes, that's true. But what, so what's the difference between ordinary and extraordinary in this context? Yeah, well, I, th I, I think that's it. Like that, that, that health, life and our health in particular, health is a good, okay, but in terms of, uh, in terms of the actions that you take to prolong that life, that they can be, you know, that they have to be proportionate and reasonable, but not necessarily overly burdensome, you know, in the sense that they're not bringing about a worse state of affairs within the person that it's, you know, we're not saying, look, you must cling on to life at all costs, at all costs. That the, that the interventions can actually be, you know, they can be um, uh, quite, br quite brutal in a sense, like that if you're saying, you know, that we're just not, <clears throat> we're not going to, we're not, we're not, we, you're not going, we're not going to let you go or, or you know, that every, every intervention, it's, it's not morally necessary to make every single intervention that's possible. You know, uh, so, I mean, some of them though are basic in terms of the extraordinary and ordinary interventions. I mean, a lot of that arose from, say, the artificial nutrition and hydration debate. You yeah. know, and said, what, what actually constitutes ordinary and extraordinary means? And, and see, the, the danger that were, that were in terms of the, the wider ethical debate here is like that what's constituting extraordinary means is getting uh, dangerously uh, minimal in a sense because uh, they are, you have some cases in some hospitals in America, for example, where the fact that you're, I've listened to a, uh, an ethicist talking about this recently and he said that the ba really, if you're in a medical facility, and you're being given food on the medical facilities place, and you're being handed food by the medical facility staff, that that constitutes an extraordinary, somehow that constitutes an extraordinary medical intervention, that that, that qualifies as a medical intervention to, to, to continue saving the person's life. So you that, have this kind of, yeah, that it's is, a, that's, it's a bizarre. that's a fairly radical. In a, that's I bizarre, mean, yeah, it's bizarre. For yeah. years, I think it would have been, everybody would have accepted. Mm. Food and water, mm. food and hydration, water, Mm. natural basic expectations yes yeah. that everybody would have that nobody could call being given food or water medication and mm. different types of medication or different artificial means of 
respiration or cardiac or whatever mm. uh, that was different but mm. food and water is a, is a, is a, is a basic okay yeah. well i want to take that point and i am bring on a bit there but i'll ask you the question first which will bring me to the, the issue of what what we're talking about here as regards what constitutes extraordinary means mm. we're talking here about a situation where there is an infectious disease right mm -hmm. now if you are a healthcare worker say you're, you're a doctor or a nurse mm -hmm. what kind of ethical limits are there and to what extent must they can we ask them to expose themselves mm -hmm. to the risk of infection mm -hmm. and, is it the case, it's, or it seems to me to be the case, that if you're a doctor or a nurse, in, in a sense, not only in a sense, I wouldn't mm -hmm. push it too far, it's a little bit like being a soldier. You go into that, you join the army under the understanding that there may, circumstances will arise where you may have to put yourself in, the, in danger, mm -hmm. physical danger, because that's your sort of. Mm -hmm. If you go into medicine, if you go into your work, there is a, that you are going to be exposed, or there's a greater, there has to be greater expectation that you're going to be in a, a situation where you may be exposed mm -hmm. to infection or to disease that somebody who is an accountant mm -hmm. or uh, an Irish teacher mm -hmm. isn't can, wouldn't normally be expected to. Mm -hmm. So, or is there the same ethical expect? Can they can can they say that we have the same rights to of protection as everybody else? Mm. Or what are the what are the ethical duties they have towards patients? Is there a different line there if you're a doctor or a patient, a doctor or a nurse? Yes, I think I, I think I mean as I mean at the institutional level and also you know that they would institutions hospitals as institutions or care centres that they do have obviously have a duty of care toward their staff. Okay, and the, but the staff also have a duty of care toward their own life, and part of part of the duty of care toward their life is because they want to maintain the capacity to to make, to intervene with uh, or to make care interventions on your life mm -hmm. so uh, so there is a kind of heightened i know what you're saying that they had there is a kind of because they've entered into that situation voluntarily but uh, so they're you know they're in a sense well look this was part of it and you must have known that and uh, but okay. i'll give you an example yeah it, it, and, and it, maybe it's a question of degree of risk and mm. degree of, there are places in certain jurisdictions now where it's being reported where direction has been given in certain kinds of care facilities mm. that uh, everybody in the facility is to be treated as if they are infectious mm. and there is a blanket dnr in mm. place mm. dnr being do not resuscitate which means that in certain situations fairly commonplace situations where they would normally use cpr mm -hmm. CPR has been not, not being used, even though there are cases that are occurring where normal procedure would mean, and the person would recover, that there, were, there was a, a mechanical failure, that you're dealing with people who are maybe elderly or maybe ill, or may have other issues. They may be in care not because either of age or of, or, or of phys physical illness, but other issues. Mm. And but under this, in the context of the pandemic, this this instruction has been come out to apply a DNR. Now that seems to me to be an ex mm -hmm. an extraordinary response. Yeah, I think I I I would I would agree. I think that that's um, whenever I think you hear the phrase blanket use, just be warned, <laughs> be cautious. Mm -hmm. I think that it's that it's that strikes me as an extraordinarily blunt tool to use uh, to respond to any any situation. I think. Uh, blanket responses to uh, what are essentially uh, going to be by virtue of just the nature of the event that are going to be they're going to require complex and and individual assessments but just to go in and just but to apply to seemingly apply a blanket ban on anything i think that i i'm not sure how that's really ethically defensible in a sense you know because uh, i think you have already uh, it's not that you're waiting for something you have already made a decision you know, you've already made the decision that the lack of the, the, the no intervention, no action is action, is an action in itself. Mm -hmm. So if you're saying, you know, well, regardless of what happens, regardless of what your prospects might be for uh, resuscitation, we're not going to do it. I think that's, I'm not sure how defensible that is. I'm not sure how ethically, how, how they justify that, uh, even in situations of limited resources. Do you, do you think that there may, in a lot of the discussions we're seeing, 
there is a fairly brutal, crude, utilitarian approach. It's a, a, a fairly brutal adding up of numbers. Mm. And that age, that we have, there's something about our culture mm. which has really devalued people over a certain age that you start it's somehow you there's a bell curve we reach a certain point at which we're, we're valuable and then we just decline that the, the culture really has lost or is losing value in, in parts yeah. for yeah. people of, who are of a certain age yeah i think that's absolutely tr absolutely true and i think that a lot of that is there's, there's that i think that that issue is so wide and so varied in one sense in terms of the root causes of that and of what we're seeing uh, in terms of the kind of the, the, the devaluation of human life the devaluation of human dignity the different kind of metrics that we use to assess who is and who isn't valuable um what are we prioritizing in terms of how we establish the value of someone's life i mean i think that there are other uh, um there's shana samani wrote a book there uh, recently can modern medicine be saved and he mentions in it there was a kind of emergence of uh, this kind of what he called healthism, you know. Essentially, yes, great book. I yes, yeah, great, yeah, yeah, great book. Yeah, yeah, great. and he, yeah, he's, scary. He made, yeah, and he made that he made that point, like in a sense that there's a kind of a cult of health, you know, and a cult a cult of youth, for want of a better word, in mm. phrase, in a sense, like. But but that that is that we say that somehow we have arrived, not somehow, but it can be probably easily traced that we have arrived at the view where youth health functionality beauty as sub the subjective all of these kind of subjective assessments in one sense uh, you know that they're kind of they these are the ways in which we measure now measure value you know the value of a person's life you know and very often maybe the word productivity is being yes, re yeah. is replacing value you know yeah, yeah. wild said famously you know, a cynic is someone who knows the price of everything and the, the value of nothing mm. And I think a lot of the things, like a lot of the things that Wilde says, it's an there's an awful lot more wisdom to that yes, than it appears sure. on first, first yeah. on first glance. Yeah. Because we do seem to be living in a cynical, ironic mm. era. Yeah. And if you can put a price on it, yeah. you can put a number on it, you can put productivity on it, yeah. then it, we feel much more comfortable yeah. with that. And the value we put on old people and the respect, we've mm. seen this in, like the respect for their opinions, their political, they shouldn't be allowed to vote a lot of the time because yeah, they're just, they're holding us back and doing the mm, voting the wrong way. It's, mm, the notion, I, I years ago, I was given a book was sort of a pop anthropology thing for kids. But mm, there was one, th one of the things that lived with me was they had two photographs, one from 1900 and one from 1980, I think it was, mm, of fathers and sons. And the author made the point in 1900s, sons mm, dressed to look like their fathers. Mm, and in 1980, fathers dressed to look like their sons <laughs> and i never occurred and but i think it's a really interesting observation yeah about, yeah. about the way that our culture has changed yeah and i, I think you, you said that we're talking about a reassessment maybe well i think during but certainly after this about how this mm. has been managed at a, at, mm. a, at a state level is going to have to be done you know for sure i mean in terms of there's, I mean, there can be no doubt, like in terms of, I think that it, it, it seems, you know, once as a load to speak of silver linings to anything like a pandemic, like, and, but in terms of, I think it will certainly, this experience in terms of the treatment of the elderly in our own country, like that it's taken a lot of, that it will take a lot of the wind out of the sails of those who are kind of maybe uh, uh, advancing a kind of euthanasia agenda in a sense uh, if you you know if you want to put it like that but our, our uh, assisted dying like that we've seen now that the actually you know the, the value of palliative care the value the value of caring you know the value of meeting suffering with compassion instead of just letting somebody to die or to directly intervene to bring about the end you know at the end of their life i think that lots of that kind of you know that kind of reevaluation will will be taking place and kind of we'll have a different kind of hopefully i mean I, there's no guarantees with these things i think everyone like it's when I think about, you know, back to even a different kind of context, but back to 2008, 2010, the, the crash, and everyone thought, okay, after this, we're going to be much more sensible people. We've really learned our lesson now. Like, we've really learned our lesson. We've had a horrendous international and national experience, and we're going to learn all these kind of wonderful ethical and moral yeah. lessons about banking and ethical accountability within mm. banking, and the culture will change, the culture shift, yeah. and none of it changed. 
So I mean, uh, that's a that's a bit of a pessimistic response, but well, I think I it is, but I think it's valid enough. You know, that we have to be careful not to over 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 egg in a sense saying that the, the lessons we are going to learn. Of course, we will learn some, but a lot of them will be enforced. Yes. Yeah, well, you remember the, the Kant's great phrase is nothing straight shall be made from the crooked timber of man. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I, yeah, yeah, but right. Man was man before 2008, man will be man after it. Yeah, but yeah. I wanted to move away just as we, as we, as we close up. Mm. Um, and then we may maybe come back to this another day if you're, if you're up for it. Of course, Michael. Um, moving away from the, 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 the issue specifically of, of, of hospital treatment, I think, but Moving to the broad, we, the, the relationship between the, the ethics, our ethical responsibilities to ourselves and to the people mm. around us. Um, and I'm thinking of this in the context of how dissent, shall we say, mm. we're a free society, it's a, a free country, mm. we'll call it that. It's a free country. It's time being until the until the last last little bits of the constitution are, 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 are hollowed out anyway. <laughs> but for the time being, it's a free country. We have habeas corpus and all sorts of things. Mm. Now, <laughs> I, I'm a reasonable person. I'm a, I'm a citizen and I don't like what's going on. I think that, mm. I don't think there's a scientific basis for that regulation or this regulation. I think that's nonsense. Mm. And I want to, uh, I want to protest on be where do we where, what are what are my responsibilities here to what extent do i have to just sort of knuckle under and say well this is it this is the law these are the the, the, the are, to what extent can i as a free man raise my fist up and say no mm -hmm. i shall not yeah. be enslaved <laughs> yeah. no i i think i mean um yeah you you do have i, I think every citizen every person really has i mean the, the, um, in terms of the dissent, you know, if we're if what we're talking about there is a person maintaining their capacity to make you know rational and uh, you know rational inquiry, or asking for justifications for the reasons for just justification for the measures that have been taken, then absolutely that should continue. And we've seen that there's a very real damage, there's very real world consequences to surrendering mm. that in terms of uh, you know the uh, undue undue deference to authority or to international institutions we'll say for example we've seen that there are problems emerging in terms of maybe the WHO's relationship with Beijing all of that and you know uh, so there's there are questions there we say you know the, 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 without the capacity to inquire without the, the capacity to demand reasons you know and not just to be simply told to put on the green jersey and shut your mouth you know okay but say for example I decide Mm. I'm, not, I'm going to drive to Arklow. Mm. Now, Arklow is 18 kilometers away. Mm. Now, I don't represent a risk to anybody. Yes. Nobody is saying that me sitting in my car here or there on the, on the way back is, represents a threat. Mm. It's not a dangerous thing to do. But I'm doing this because this is my form of protest. But mm. I'm, I am... To the, I don't, breaking the law and certainly breaking a, legis, a, a regulation. Yeah, yeah. And I could be put in prison for 28 days. Mm, mm. Where do we... Does there come a point in the thing where it, be, where it becomes... The state becomes so excessively intrusive, mm. so excessively controlling mm. that I have... That I do have the ethical... Yeah, I, I think you always have to. I think you. I think there's never really a situation where you where people don't ha, can simply abandon their responsibility to critically inquire uh, and, and to look for reasons why why a certain measure is taken or what's the justification for it. Like I said, but I think the danger is you know that, and a lot of that if we don't do that, there's that kind of Gramscian notion where you know the kind of pepperoni or kind of slicing off liberty mm. one bit at a time, and before you know it, where are we? That kind of thing, and that's not too over kind of exaggerated because I mean, in a sense, this is in, within a social context. This is how it happens. Liberty is often, I mean, I think Lord Sumption in the UK made that statement. He said that this is actually how it, this is how it happens, that people have this idea that if somebody came and said to me, I'm going to take away all of your liberty, I would revolt. But somehow we, we have arrived at a situation where they didn't have to come and say it. We gave that right to them. And yes. we don't seem to be standing back or to stepping up and saying, Do you know what, I'd like actually a stronger justification for what you're saying there. 
and that's the and that's where you see uh, there are ethical issues. There are ethical issues around transparency and accountability in government institutions or civic institutions. Like you know, it's all, it's all very well asking us to display civic solidarity. That's fine. We need to do that at some level. But but should that necessarily um, um, uh, should that necessarily lead to a situation where we could say, okay, now I, I just I, I have to just accept what you're saying and that's it? No, I don't. That that that's it. That is not uh, that is not a good response for anything. Really. I suppose it's it's a it's a question of you wait and see. I'm I'm reminded of Aquinas when on the subject of uh, our duty to obey bad law, mm. and Aquinas says that the citizen, the citizen, the, yeah, the citizen, ca has a right mm. to rebel against a tyrant mm. and to refuse to obey evil laws, mm. but only to a certain point that mm. there has to be, the, the, the evil has to be sufficiently great. Yes. Yeah. Because the, the good, which is the maintenance of law, mm. is, so, is so important mm. for, 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 for the maintenance of a, of a of civil society. Mm -hmm. That anything which threatens the idea of the global mm -hmm. good of law mm -hmm. has to be something very, very serious indeed. Yeah. Before we can actually say to ourselves, okay, I'm going to break the law because I'm no longer mm -hmm. bound by the law, morally speaking, because the, the law is evil. So, yeah, you can do that. I mean, in terms, there are plenty of historical examples about that, aren't they? Rosa Parks, anybody, you know, in terms of, you know, that you can, you know, just because the law is in place doesn't, I, yeah, you're right. I think, but it is generally speaking a matter of degrees in terms, but I think that no. Uh, but isn't I, that the problem, though? As you, like you say, it's Gramsci and the salami. Absolutely. When they come for these things, they won't come with yeah. two, two fists out to grab it. It'll be slice yeah. by slice by slice. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And I think there's plenty of examples. You don't have to look to, we don't have to look to Gramsci either. I mean, a lot of the situation like that in the, you know, in terms of the um, Jonah Goldberg wrote a very a great book on that kind of a, a you know a liberal tyranny kind of you know yes. kind of a sense and that, a lot of the history there a lot of that is on the on the on the left, which is uncomfortable reading for them in a sense like but uh, but it uh, nevertheless there's plenty of history. Okay, I'll, I'll ask you one last question and before and then I'll release you. <laughs> um, talking with lots of people of ethical individually as citizens we have ethical responsibilities nothing. To ourselves, but also to the people with whom we share mm. uh, this, the, our space, our, 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 our communities, mm. politicians, healthcare, every the police, they, we all have just journalists. Mm. Okay, as a nation, we maybe at these times have a duty to get together and be gung ho and cooperate. Mm. But do you think that it's that, that as, is it the case that at a time like this? Perhaps journalists have a particular duty mm. to be annoying. Mm. Absolutely. I, mean, I, I just I, wonder if the moment we're seeing a media which is a little bit too compliant, that, that they have yeah. an ethical responsibility to question, which is yeah. not maybe being pursued. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think, I mean, we spoke earlier about blanket bans on DNRs, and I think the same can be said, like whenever you see blanket consensus, you should start to be start to be wary of that okay so whenever there's journalistic consensus i think that there's something wrong i that's my initial instinct there's always something wrong if there's this widespread journalistic consensus now a lot of that in ireland of course is because you know there's not necessarily a disparate kind of media we're all just you know there is a lot of group think heard thinking about that about the, the social issues like and uh, even within the journalistic class if you want to put it but but i do think that it, there's absolutely an, um, a moral uh, imperative uh, on journal uh, for journalists to critically engage and not just to be you know uh, yes men or yes women or to kind of ingratiate themselves into a state into into the state apparatus like you know that it become mouth essentially become mouthpieces and I don't think many of them I mean there's a lot of good journalists out there of course there are I can sense but but at the same time there's a real I think there's a real concern that people are raising people say why or why are we not asking these questions these are basic questions like why is nobody asking them I mean there are, all we seem to be getting is uh, puff pieces on uh, the Minister of Health or whatever. You know, there's a kind yeah. of where is, the, where is the really critical engagement about that, and that, and that's some and that's part of the pursuit of truth. You know, that's part of the pursuit of truth without being necessarily partisan about it and saying I hate the Irish Times or I hate the Independent or I hate whatever. You know, it's not about being you know just getting all riled up about it. 
but, sure. but, for, but for actually you know to situate that within a wider within within a more fundamental context and say no there's actually we, we each of us have a moral duty and journalists in particular to pursue the truth and to be evidence-based in what we're saying and not just to simply repeat mantras that are coming from the state or state bodies or state uh, you know so we yeah. have a duty there yeah. it strikes me that you have all these journalists in the room quizzing representatives of the, of the government of the state. Mm. And if this was anything else, mm. the assumption would be that the people in front of you are incompetent, stupid and corrupt. Yeah, yeah. And they would be desperately trying to catch them out. Yeah, yeah. And they would be doing so with regular ease. But for some, mm. in this case, everybody's been transformed yeah. into yeah. these perfect, competent administrators who, have made, who haven't hardly made a mistake. Yeah, and the same people who would have been absolutely tearing strips out of them not eight weeks ago, yeah. you know, before the election, which is often is which is which is really desperately odd. Like you know, but I, I think you're right. I mean, there's that there's that um, you know, assumptions are really bad. Our assumptions are bad for uh, bad journalistic practice, and I don't you know in terms of uh, you know assuming kind of like I said competence or whatever. You know, I think that no, just the evidence the evidence is pretty clear. You know that they you know that. Uh, and this is not a matter, you see, I think that there's a kind of a, one of the problems, like one of the difficulties is like that, again, the kind of state kind of says, you know, there's a, there's moral pressure applied, you know, there's a kind of a nudging, you know, a kind of a behavioral kind of nudging going on and saying like, look, well, you know, you can raise those questions if you like, like, but at the same time, you're kind of, you know, you're, you, you might be bringing about as, uh, you know, uh, you're destabilizing trust in the in the state in the state response mm. and is that really a good thing overall and you know is That's your critical is your critical question of me really worth uh, undermining the state effort you know and um and so i think that where those those, those kind of little kind of implied kind of moral pressures can easily you know they're easily they're easily applied in one sense you know but you have to be very careful of course yeah. and, and you have to have a display a bit of moral courage to resist them. Absolutely. That's that not to be part of the gang. Yeah, Listen, yeah. Dave, I'm going to say Thanks a million for talking to you. It's been really interesting. I hope, I'm sure the folks out there have enjoyed it. And you never know, I'm, we might be back on your door to annoy you sometime <laughs> soon. But anyway, for the time being, thank you very much and stay yeah. safe. No bother. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you. Folks, I'd like to thank you again for joining us. Um, I think you agree with me. That was an interesting, illuminating, stimulating. Maybe we come out with as many questions as we've had answers. And that's a good thing. I'd like to uh, ask you again, if you could, just like the old page there, subscribe to the video so you, you know when new stuff comes up. And as you know, our work keeps going on even this, in this difficult time. And if you could click on that link, Seymour, and anything that you can do to help us to keep going with the work would be really, really appreciated at this time. Anyway, thank you and stay safe and mind yourselves.